Hello, welcome to Kate Siegel's home with Alan Capel, and we're going to see her collection for Arts and Conversations today. So thank you for letting us in your home. So, all right, Katie, mm -hmm. you are the one that got the bug in me for your collecting style. And you come back and you just live with this incredible art. And then you said, well, I'm really feeling comfortable about this because of Alan Coppell. Yeah. So explain how this symbiotic relationship happened with the two of you and what's your collecting style? Um, I, I'm just going to tell our story, okay. and that That's is right. that Alan, my ex-husband Howard, was a trader with Alan in his previous life as a commodities trader. Alan used to trade also with my father-in-law at the time, and my husband would talk about this collector, Alan Coppell, that how just so active in art collecting and then Alan made this transition to being a dealer and so I had never met Alan I would just hear about him and one day a postcard from Alan landed in the mail <laughs> and Alan's like so that's Alan Coppell let's go visit because a dream of mine would was to collect, to buy quality art. But I had no instruction book, and we had bought a few pieces at an art fair, but I really wanted to ensure quality. And, and so we went to visit Alan at his home, and I met Sherry. And from there, so that was maybe early 90s, Alan? Uh, probably middle 90s. And, he, and then you can take it from there. Yeah. Well, uh, I was a trader on the Chicago Board of Trade and Chicago Mercantile Exchange for about 25 years, and uh, I always collected art avidly. I loved trading and I loved collecting art. And uh, in the mid 90s, uh, trading had been very good to me, and I was in my mid 40s, and I just got a little tired of uh, the daily grind. And uh, so I decided to, uh, I, had a, I had a very big collection of art that I had accumulated and I sold it just at the end of the 80s. I just felt that the market was very inflated and uh, uh, I felt that it was a good time to sell it. I wasn't a speculator per se, I didn't buy art because I, was, I thought it was going up in value, uh, even though it did. Uh, but the things had gone up so much. Things that I paid five and six thousand dollars for were worth a you know a quarter of a million dollars. And my trader instinct said there'll be other things to buy. And I sold everything. I must have had sixty pieces, and I sold fifty-five of them. Wow. And uh, uh, then in the early nineties, I started to buy back, and instead of the contemporary things I was buying, du buffets and Picasso drawings and things that were uh, had were now worth you know thirty you know thirty cents on the dollar, forty cents on the dollar from where they were very overinflated, and basically that's how I made the transition. I decided I really liked doing this, so I started to buy Warhols and. Uh, Lachets and uh, uh, you know Richters and basically the the backbone of the contemporary art market. So how I was going to ask this question later, but how with your influence, someone like Kate coming to you saying, "Boy, um, I don't really know what I don't know. How can you help guide me? Are you guiding?" someone like Kate, who has a very sophisticated collection, to the kind of art you're personally collecting, or are you tailoring it a little differently to what her style might be? No. <laughs> what I'm doing, <laughs> what I'm 
doing is that I will only sell her things that I would want to buy myself of the quality. And the thing is, what it takes is it takes a lot of editing. And the thing is that do I pander to somebody's taste who's sort of just a novice at collecting, or do I bring them up the pyramid? And my philosophy is uh, I'd rather bring them up the pyramid. It might be very sophisticated, they might not quite understand it, but I know if they continue at it, they'll understand it in a number of years. And I'm very open to people questioning things and uh, giving them as much information as they want. You know? And we have conversations about it. And we have conversations of why is this piece, you know, why, why this piece and not this piece? And, uh, and it could be by the same artist's work, you know. And I find that incredibly fascinating. And I know personally when I decided I was going to put my big toe into this world, I called you immediately. Mm -hmm. And you left me with books and movies to watch and start educating yourself. And you will start to see what appeals to you in this opera. Listen, it... You're collecting contemporary art. Contemporary art, in a sense, starts or uh, it starts sort of with post impressionism and moves forward. I mean, it could be modern art, contemporary art. Uh, I know there's a big difference between the two, but the thing is that there are sources, and you're talking about roughly a hundred and some odd years, and I think most people could. Uh, can grasp the historical aspects of you know taking a period of a hundred years. We're not talking about you know five thousand years of art history, or you know, or we're talking about one specific period of of modern and contemporary art, post impressionism, which starts basically in impressionism, post impressionism. Well, let's then go start seeing this incredible collection, and we can uh, talk about a few pieces. I just want to say one other thing. Is that okay? <laughs> of course. What I want to say is there's this wonderful series that was produced in the 80s on you and it's on YouTube. And it's called The Shock of the New. It was done by Robert Hughes and PBS. And it's available to anybody. And there's eight episodes in it. And there's it, there's a companion book of The Shock of the New. And it's and it basically starts in uh, you know, it starts in probably in post-impressionism and it goes to like the 1980s because that's when the series was done. But I recommend it to everybody who wants a basic knowledge of, uh, of art of the 20th century. Beautiful. Let's go look at a collection. Well, this, this Duchamp is a more recent piece, but it's an example of how Alan uh, encouraged us to begin. I think our first piece was in so we started to collect the modern, say right. modern masters. Uh, uh, originally, when you were married to your former yeah. husband, we had uh, we had Man Ray things, uh, objects, and we had uh, uh, Warhols and uh, Boucher's and uh, uh, Damien Hirst's and right. Mark Tanzies, and uh, and then when you moved into this place and. Uh, after your divorce, we decided to make a new collection, mm -hmm. pretty much. Mm -hmm. And my feeling was that you want some things <clears throat> that are classical, you know, sort of like the backbone of contemporary art, and then you want to build from there. So the thing is that each thing has a reason to be, you know, in the collection. So let's, we start here with uh, uh, the new Descending Staircase Number Two, which is probably the most one of the most famous pieces in the history of modern art. And the thing was, this is a pushoir of the painting, and it was done in 1934. And Duchamp gave a number of these to friends of his. And there's a five centine stamp on here, and it's signed by Duchamp. There's a lot of you know I could go into the reasons why he had the stamp and the thing, uh, the signature. 
but it's sort of this very classic piece. And next to it is a photograph of the newts descending the stairs by Richter, and it's and signed by Richter. So the thing is that you're seeing the influence here. Now, over here is uh, the Ai Weiwei. Is in Ai Weiwei of a door, and Ai Weiwei. So this piece has sort of a double meaning to it. First of all, it's very much like a philosopher's stone in you know that that you see in Chinese art. And the second thing is, it's also very Duchampian because Duchampian uh, Duchamp did this piece of called Eleven Rue Larry, and it's basically a door that's made, and it, the door has could open and close, and it has two functions to it, a similar door, and he allowed this, he designed it, but he didn't produce it, and it was designed by a craftsman who produced who produced the door, very much, I think, the way Ai Weiwei had this door produced, and uh, it's, uh, I just thought this is just a beautiful, elegant little corner, you know, and it's all about sort of art history, and it's beautiful, you know what I mean? Uh, it's stunning placement, but I like understanding better yeah. how it is uh, placed. Our, let's move and over then we here. Go here, and there. So we're we're looking at different phases of art. So this is uh, a Cubist composition by uh, Max Weber from uh, 1915. Here is a Duchamp of uh, called Raze, where Duchamp. It's, Duchamp did this piece called the L.A. to O.Q., but later on, he, where he put a mustache and a beard on uh, the Mona Lisa. So basically what he did is he took this most iconic image of, in art, and he, uh, and he put a beard and a mustache. He basically sabotaged it. And here, later on, he's going back and he writes Razé, where he just, he shaved it off. You know, Razé means to shave, oh and he, he eliminated the beard. <laughs> so he, so he brought it back to, uh, he brought it back to what it was, but it was his doing, you know, his origination of the sabotage and his ori origination. And he sort of, by removing it, he sort of re-sabotaged it again, you know oh what I mean? So, now this is a very interesting piece, and incredibly rare. Uh, this is by uh, Jean Croti, and it's uh, what's called a taboo drawing. It was done in the in the early twenties, and they're very rare. They're like hen's feet, and this is really a fabulous one. I didn't know hens had teeth. Okay, yeah. come over here, and we're going to we're taking a full circle. Uh, this is this is a, a beautiful piece by uh, Bonalumi, and uh, it's uh, he was an Italian. Uh, uh, artist uh, who who did work in the you know he started I guess in the late 60s and 70s but it's really beautiful and it's elegant and it really is a punch to the room also so we're you know we're concerned about how things look you know what I mean in the in the house so Kate, in this oh, piece okay. I admire this okay. for a couple of years we yeah. go visit Alan and there there it is there's that piece and then finally I think a few years after probably had it for yeah. two or three years. Uh, Alan, I think I, I really want to have it. Um, just after visiting it in Alan's uh, gallery. So we're going to move, it's stunning, and we're going to move over here. And I'm curious, Kate, what was the most challenging piece of art that you felt, oh my gosh, I'm jumping off the deep end. Right. And Alan, before you answer that, could you stand next to Kate so the microphone? Oh, yeah. Sure. Right. I think where was a leaf? Uh, it could have been either with the Ai Weiwei or the Rebecca Warren. So are we going to start with the Rebecca Warren? Yes. Then? Okay. Let me. Uh, I would say this. Let me. Was. A very exciting piece. It was because 
Alan described the piece to me and he talked about Rebecca Warren and then was it even in the gallery or I went straight through the so. department? I think it went straight to the department. And then so I had other ones that I showed you and uh -huh. I said I, I found this really spectacular one. And uh, this is really fairly early in her career, you know, and you know, we were very lucky to get it. And yes. it was very, you know, sort of reasonably priced, I think. And, and then so having it in the space how it transformed the space, and it still holds every room. Yeah. I can't imagine not having her. She's uh, one of my favorites, I just, right? uh, if I can weigh in. She's spectacular. So I would say that this is one of those pieces where I felt it just brought me to another level of, of not quite experimentation, but courage and faith, and then when you live with it, it's reinforced because the beauty and the, the strength, it's the beauty, the strength, the feminism, the power of the body, it just speaks to me all the time. Stunning. All right, right behind you. Uh, this is a, uh, <laughs> not the underdog. This is a wonderful piece by Dexter Dalwood, who's a British artist. This piece was in his show when he was up for the Turner Prize at the Tate. And it's a, a really fabulous piece. And uh, I sort of brought it into the department thinking that it would really be strong and beautiful. And they responded. You know, yeah, to no, I love it. Yeah. I love like the, the solitude, uh, the beauty of it, the story behind it suicide of a, of a gentleman who had fought, who had found weapons of mass destruction right. in, in Iraq, and right. he ended up sadly committing suicide. Oh, my word. Yeah. yeah. The death of David Kelly. Yeah, the death of David Kelly. So, um, it's, and it's beautiful, and then having, um, that size of a piece, because it was a new thing. With this apartment, I I got some big walls. Yeah. And so there was an opportunity to have a piece of this size where I didn't have it in my previous space. Stunning. Can we walk into the dining room? Sure. <laughs> And what is uh, Vic's, what is this piece from? It's, it's uh, based on a Richter painting okay. of Betty, who was his wife. And so this is a piece by uh, an artist, Zero Group, uh, and his name is Armando. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a piece about, uh, you know, it's about European history, you know what I mean? And it has, undertones of the Holocaust and things like that. So I think it's a very, it's a difficult piece and it's uh, it's severe, but it's it's beautiful and it's thought provoking also. And I love the, that it's um, a shade of white and uh, there's a purity to it and there's a purity to, to the ideas that it's about. Stunning. And what do we have over here? This is a piece, an early piece by Donald Moffat. And uh, uh, Donald's work is about you know, texture and, uh, and it's an innovative way of painting because this painting is, it almost looks like it's metal, but it's, uh, it's all oil paint. I just 
In my experience with the apartment, it is a collaboration between my designer, Doug Levine, my architect, Howard Holtzman, and Alan. So I have the three major persons, friends, who are a major influence on my life in my development as a person who appreciates aestheticism. Alan's a key person of that, that journey. Um, but Doug is another person, and so I feel the, really, you have to yeah, say it's we work collaboratively. We, uh, Howard's my closest friend, so, uh, and Doug's a friend of mine also. So we, you know, we bounce ideas off each other. I've worked with Alan for probably close to 30 years, right, Alan? Yeah. And Howard Holtzman, we did four projects together, so that's, 20 years and Doug also the same. So what's happened is they, I get to know their work, they get to know me, and so I get to live with my friends in a way. Uh, this is an actually an addition piece, but I love some of these really early pistolettos. I actually like them more than some of the unique pieces, and I just think it's has a very Renaissance feel to it. And I think it's just beautiful. It's, I love it. Yeah. And it's so much fun because it does play as a, as a mirror as you come and go from the apartment. And I just love that aspect of it. It's fun. And what do we have behind uh, you? That's a Jacques Villiglay piece. Mm -hmm. And Jacques Villiglay is a, a French nouveau realist. sort of the European side of pop art. And he, he's been doing these, this work since the, the late uh, 40s. And he's in his uh, middle 90s right now. And still working. And still working. Yeah. Wow. Didn't, this is, didn't he start in the, yeah, the end of the war? And yeah. taking posters. Right. It's called a fish. So <laughs> it's decollage. And Coulage is what uh, Picasso and Brock invented by putting, it means to paste. Decollage means to unglue, so. Oh. You are a historian, that's lovely. And Kate, who is behind you? Oh, this was done by a friend of mine, Jonathan Miller. And um, it's this beautiful play on how did this little box get into the big box? And the, the attention to building something like this would be uh, pretty masterful to do it. And um, the shadow down. So Jonathan is a friend of mine. And more recently, I have purchased from people I know, like, yeah, it's nice. like Dan yeah. Rudick. All right, and let's move over here. Uh, this is uh, a rotor relief by Duchamp. Yeah, and we we uh, we made a, sh a, a type of shell because it's two sided. Oh, yeah. oh! Voila! See, see both sides of it. Oh! This was one of our first pieces. Yeah. And it was in the yeah twenty four thirty. Yeah. Yeah, you had it in the fireplace, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. And this is a Ray Johnson. I love the Ray Johnsons with uh, with Lucky Strike symbols on them. I just think they're really lovely pieces. And Robert Moskowitz is a wonderful artist, but he's very underrated by the marketplace. But he produces and produces spectacular paintings. And uh, uh, this is a piece that was done, I think, in 1995 of the Twin Towers. It's called Skyscraper. Skyscraper towers since the early uh, since the middle seventies, I think. Wow! Yeah. I didn't See, that's, know that. So that's another that's question serious. for you, um, Alan. Yeah. How you know underrated by the marketplace? That goes back to another. I always think an important thing. You should love what you buy. 
regardless it's, of what the market. It's true, but the thing is that if you're buying something that's very expensive, it should have a relative value to something in the real world. You know what I mean? So that's, that's what I think. I mean, I think a lot of things get overhyped. And, you know, it, it's the same thing with, you know, you have a limited supply of an artist's work and you have a lot of people that are interested in it. So they, you know, they keep bidding it up and bidding it up and bidding it up and, you know, and, uh, and sometimes, you know, that's, uh, that's a problem and a lot of that stuff might not last. And Matthew Metzger just had a show at the Renaissance Society, uh, I think it was in September, and this is a piece called Machete. And I just love his work. I think he's an extraordinary painter. Uh, he, uh, you know, he's not really very well known. I mean, he's he's known to certain people in Chicago. He he teaches at UIC. He's I think he's an associate professor there. But his work is totally extraordinary. To say I own seven pieces of his, I love his work that much. Do you want, yeah. can we talk about Jovan Speller? Yes, will you talk about her? Okay. <laughs> Minneapolis, actually, she's a, a newer artist. She uh, is, work. she does a lot of over, she's a, a sculptor, she's a painter, she works in collage, uh, she works in wood, she works in resin, and her history is her grandfather worked on a plantation as a cotton picker. And Coming Home is a lot of the series, and that is, this piece is articles from the farm of her grandfather. Aww. And then shellac on wood. This is a series of Hiroshi Sugimoto's dioramas. Uh, and uh, I love his work, and this piece I felt was just a spectacular piece which gives you an idea of his, the range of his work when it comes to uh, these dioramas. Most of these were done at the Museum of Natural History in New York. Beautiful. And we're gonna walk into your guest room, Kate. Mm -hmm. Peter Halley, and his pieces are usually like the acid, bright, bright colors. And those would frighten me, actually, from the beginning. Today, I would buy a, a one of his brighter pieces because I've just gotten much more courageous in living with the pieces that speak so loudly. But this one is beautiful. I remember it was in the library at, at my other home, and right. it looked great, uh -huh. and I love it here. Yeah, and it's all these metallics, and the metallics feel like metal almost, you know. And it's the theme of the prison. Yeah. Um, they're very, urban, they're very urban. They're very urban paintings. Yeah, I'm a big fan. Matthew Metzger had also had at the time a German dealer in Berlin, and that's actually where I. S he's a Chicago artist, but I found his work at Art Basel being represented by Aratia Bear, which at the time was a gallery in Germany in Berlin, and they did a show at the Armory, and I saw this piece. And I s called Kate up and I said, Kate, you should just buy this piece. I'm just, I'm gonna buy it and you're gonna buy it from me. <laughs> and that's basically what happened. It's beautiful. And it's... Uh, it's another example, which I really love um, how unique, when you have the scale of ceilings and walls, that you don't fill every corner of it, that a piece that invites you in. So this scale is yeah. small and yet it holds that wall. It holds this incredible small. room. A good small painting can hold a very big wall. This piece was one of the first, and it's like talking about going over the edge. I yeah. was afraid to buy this one. Oh yeah. <laughs> I was, and I'm so glad we did. The process of 
going with the heart and feeling I don't have to know everything mm -hmm. about all these artists. I can trust Alan and go with my heart and just live my life because I don't chase down galleries or go to a lot of museums, but I love living with the beautiful arts. They're meaningful in my life story, but the comfort of knowing I can have a collection, I don't have to know everything. I can enjoy Tell me it. who this dancer is, speaking of knowing. Darcy Bushell. And she's a British, she's a contemporary ballerina. Uh, this is a fairly new purchase of an artist that I discovered. Uh, and his name is Carlos Sagrara. And he paints in Leipzig, Germany, but he's actually from Madrid. And uh, he produces these really stunning images of uh, interiors, but they also have this abstract quality to them where the image is actually sort of pulling apart. I love the shadows. Thank you, everybody, for watching Arts and Conversations. Kate, Alan, wow, stunning. It's fun. Yeah. It's like the edit. And our next film is going to be seeing Alan and Sherry Capel's personal collection. So thanks for tuning in.